Welcome back to our DNA and design series. Uh, this is the second uh, lecture in the subseries, the chicken and egg problem. And just to remind you, the chicken and egg problem has to do with DNA and proteins. And the basic idea is that you need DNA to make proteins, but you also need a suite of proteins already functioning inside the cell to be able to use the DNA to make those proteins. So those proteins basically have to exist so that you can make them from DNA. And that, of course, is a big hurdle in any kind of random evolution hypothesis. And it is a significant motivation for an intelligent design hypothesis where the DNA and the relevant proteins um, are co-created, if you will, or arise together in a coordinated fashion. Now, we need to talk about the leading hypothesis that has been advanced to solve this chicken and egg problem, since it is a very large problem and obviously a, uh, a very glaring problem uh, in terms of uh, origin of life theories and evolutionary biology. And that leading hypothesis is called the RNA world. And we will cover that uh, in this lecture. So what is the RNA world hypothesis? Well, briefly, it is that RNA can solve this problem, or at least potentially solve this problem, by functioning as both the chicken and the egg. So if you'll follow the slide with me, the basic idea is that inorganic sources in the prebiotic soup uh, with uh, RNA bases being synthesized uh, in something like the miller urey experiment that we talked about, ribose sugars, phosphates, all coming together, form RNA molecules. Now, these RNA molecules can do supposedly several things. They can self-replicate uh, in a sort of enzymatic function uh, to help them replicate themselves. And uh, that kind of function is aided by RNA molecules called ribozymes. And RNA, if you remember, is really the template that gets made from DNA to synthesize proteins. So RNA would somehow catalyze protein synthesis. And then if the RNA gets enclosed in a membrane, there are enzymes uh, that can actually code backwards and turn RNA into DNA. We've talked about how DNA becomes RNA and then that RNA serves as the template for protein synthesis. Well, there are enzymes called reverse transcriptases that can code backwards and turn the RNA into DNA. And so in this way, RNA can in theory give rise to both DNA and the proteins necessary to make the cell function and to replicate DNA. So RNA can be both the chicken and the egg. And so that is the RNA world hypothesis advanced by its proponents to try to solve the chicken and egg problem. Now, I know we've covered a lot of science together in a lot of detail, and frankly, I'm guessing you're probably kind of tired by now. So I won't go into as much detail here, but suffice it to say that the RNA world hypothesis actually is riddled with serious problems. So here, for example, is a blurb from Quantum Magazine, and you can see the title of this article, uh, that the end of the RNA world uh, is near, biochemists argue. So although the RNA world hypothesis was advanced because the chicken and egg problem would be an insurmountable problem, when biochemists 
have started to take a detailed look at all of those steps we talked about, it turns out that the theory also really has essentially insurmountable problems of its own. And it is now gotten to the point that many biochemists would argue that this theory is done, that the end of the RNA world is, is near. So here again is uh, continuing with that blurb that uh, Charles Carter, who's a structural biologist at the University of North Carolina, uh, has, for example, presented evidence that there's no way that RNA could do all of the things that it is purported to do. Uh, it could not catalyze its own uh, replication as well as catalyze the synthesis of proteins as well as somehow be sequence specific to be able to get those things uh, done because they have to be coordinated together. Um, and uh, one of the problems, for example, that Charles Carter points out is that protein enzymes that are very essential to the cell basically catalyze and coordinate chemical reactions that can differ in speed by as much as 20 orders of magnitude. That would be that one reaction would be, for example, 100 billion billion times faster than another. And proteins can coordinate those different reaction rates. RNAs are very poor catalysts, and they do not have the sort of specificity to coordinate these reaction rates. In addition, and again, I want to be a little bit lighter on the science in, in this lecture, but when protein enzymes work, they have a very specific function. They can take reactions that are energetically unfavorable that wouldn't occur on their own or would occur so slowly as to be incompatible with life and couple them with more energetically favorable reactions to be able to speed the slow reactions up, like drawing energy from one source to funnel it into another. RNA enzymatic activity is nothing like that. It can catalyze, speed up a single reaction that would go on its own, but it is entirely unable to couple unfavorable reactions to favorable reactions. And without that, there can be no life. Now, here is a paper published in the journal Biology Direct, which is actually trying to defend the RNA world hypothesis. Um, and look at its title. It says the RNA world hypothesis, the worst theory of the early evolution of life, except for all the others. And that really is basically why the RNA world hypothesis has survived because of an insistence that intelligent design cannot be advanced as a legitimate scientific theory. And this is the only conceivable way that the chicken and egg problem can be solved. And so this article itself uh, cites these objections that you see on the right hand side of the slide. And again, we won't go into the detail we've gone into before, but you can see that there are several very serious objections. First, RNA is too complex a molecule to have arisen prebiotically. There's pretty much a consensus on that, and we'll talk about that a bit more, but this is similar to when we discussed the random um, origin of proteins linking together the necessary amino acids to produce a functional protein, while linking together the necessary RNA bases to produce a functional RNA molecule turns out to be just as complex. Um, worse yet, objection number two, RNA is an inherently unstable molecule. And if you have been following the COVID vaccine issue, you realize that these new mRNA uh, vaccines that have been developed by Pfizer and Moderna one of the huge breakthroughs was being able to coat them in a substance to kind of keep them stable long enough to synthesize enough protein to incite uh, an a, a immunologic reaction uh, because RNA is inherently unstable and, and breaks down quite quickly. 
Um, objection number three, RNA needs to be able to, instead of the early proteins that we talked about as being so critical to life, if life started in an RNA world, RNA needs to be able to undergo the catalytic function of proteins. We talked about that briefly already, that it can't span the orders of magnitude necessary for reactions of different reaction rates. It does not act as a true enzyme coupling favorable and unfavorable reactions. But in any case, the catalytic repertoire is very limited and it is a very rare property of very long RNA sequences only. So it is very difficult and very unlikely to make an RNA that has any catalytic function whatsoever. And objection number four, we've already talked about that the catalytic repertoire of RNA is too limited. Proteins function as enzymes in thousands of reactions in the body. There is no known RNA molecule that can do anything like that. So here is uh, something from a uh, uh, one of the scientific papers uh, we've been talking about. And basically, what it is saying is that, again, the probabilistic resources hurdle is too huge to overcome for RNA uh, to be a viable lone precursor of life for the RNA world hypothesis to actually be a viable hypothesis. And it turns out that only long, long RNA molecules have any capacity to catalyze self-replication, to replicate themselves, which would be necessary for life. And all of the experiments that have shown some limited capacity to do that, have started out injecting a lot of information into the situation, basically selecting out from a large library of RNA molecules, culling the ones that can do that. And you probably need an RNA molecule of at least 100 nucleotides to begin even making uh, this synthesis. And uh, it turns out that, again, the probabilistic resources of the universe cannot do that. So one um, author is basically saying here that the way these things start is you basically have to start off with something on the order of 10 trillion or 10 Quadru uh, 10 trillion to a quadrillion randomized RNA molecules to call them to isolate some sort of ribozyme self-replicating activity. And he is saying that this is completely divorced from the probable prebiotic situation. And so one biologist uh, named Charles Carter Reviewing a paper on the RNA world hypothesis says, quote, I for one have never subscribed to this view of the origin of life, and I am by no means alone. The RNA world hypothesis is driven almost entirely by the flow of data from very high technology combinatorial libraries whose relationship to the prebiotic world is anything but worthy of, quote, unanimous support. There are several serious problems associated with it, and I view it as little more than a popular fantasy. So basically what this author is saying is that you have to start off knowing what you want to achieve and synthesize a very specific RNA molecule that would be extremely unlikely to be synthesized in nature. You use combinatorial libraries to call the right molecule, and this would not happen in nature. And... Um, brings up the extremely serious, probably fatal objection that we'll talk about next. And that fatal objection again comes from this paper or this article, The End of the RNA World is Near. It is that the RNA hypothesis does not solve the information problem that we've already talked about with DNA. And you can read the last part of this quote, but basically what um, 
this scientist is saying, uh, his name is Peter Wills uh, from uh, University of Auckland in New Zealand, is that again, if you look at having to try to synthesize an RNA molecule that has any sort of enzymatic activity, even though we've seen that that enzymatic activity is insufficient and too limited and cannot support the beginning of life and end, but to have anything even remotely functional, you need to inject information to do that. You need to start with a combinatorial library and call the right sort of RNA molecule and so forth. So you already have put in the information necessary for life to begin and not have had that information arise on its own. And any sort of viable mechanism to explain the origin of life has to be able to explain how the information necessary for life arose at random. And the RNA world hypothesis cannot do that at all.